Thanks, Tony. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts and perspectives with you on the uh, future of uh, informatics and, and you know, healthcare in general, but informatics is part of that. Um, you all must be Lutherans. You're sitting in the back of the church. So, uh, or Catholics. Or Catholics, yeah. Well, we're pretty related. <laughs> um, so it's a real pleasure. I'm going to be tied here because we're doing a WebEx. So I usually wander around. So uh, if I start to wander, you're supposed to point me back to the microphone. Um, this is my metaphor for uh, what is going on in healthcare. This is a very, very famous uh, Japanese painting. It's the uh, painting of a tsunami wave uh, from uh, Southeast Asia. And the Chinese anagram uh, on the right is the word for tsunami. I use that as my metaphor for healthcare because uh, tsunamis are very interesting. A lot of people actually didn't know what a tsunami was in the United States up until about four years ago on Christmas Eve and we all woke up and we watched this huge wave come ashore in Southeast Asia and it caused massive destruction. And that was the first time that a lot of Americans at least had seen a tsunami except for those in Hawaii and on the West Coast. Um, what's interesting about a tsunami is that it's basically a sound wave that's moving through water and is caused as a result of a disruption that occurs in the surface of the earth, usually from an earthquake, but it can be caused by other kinds of disruptions as well, a collapse of a mountain or you know, volcanoes, things like that, but it's usually an earthquake. And it's, so it's a sound wave that moves through water. And what's interesting about the tsunami is that when you're out in the middle of the ocean and a tsunami goes by, you don't even notice it because it dissipates into the depths of the ocean. It's only when the tsunami gets close to shore that it creates a massive wave of destruction that you cannot stop. You cannot build brick walls high enough. You cannot plant enough trees. Tsunamis will destroy everything in their path. So the destruction is separated from the disruption. I think that's what's going on in healthcare. I think that we have a number of things that started to occur about a decade ago that are causing tsunami waves in the healthcare industry, and I don't see that those tsunami waves are going to go away. And I'm going to build, a, hopefully, a case around this point, and I want to talk with you about what I think some of those tsunami waves are, why they're occurring, and what we can do uh, in the healthcare industry, because I believe that the issue for us is not to learn how to stop tsunami waves. Instead, it, our job is to learn how to search tsunamis. That's what we need to learn how to do. And that's a whole different task. Jonathan Swift in 1711 said, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Charles Duell, 1887, everything that can be invented has been invented. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Harry Warner, who the hell wants to hear actors talk anyway? Vision is the art of seeing things. My, my favorite visionary, 640K ought to be enough for anybody. <laughs> or more recently, more recently, Back in 2003, the spam problem will be solved by 2006. So, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. I use that quote because I think one of the issues that we have is that we, uh, our vision is cloudy in healthcare. And I really adhere to what Marcel Proust said when he said the real voyage of discovery consists not in finding new lands, but of seeing the territory with new eyes. And that is exactly what we need to do in healthcare. You know, it's interesting in healthcare, <clears throat> we all come from various vantage points. We have uh, those of us who are physicians, and we have our vantage point. We have nurses, they have theirs. We have executives, they have yet another vantage point. And I think that one of the solutions to the healthcare problem is to take off the blinders and begin to look at what our industry is all about and how it operates and what it can do and take off the blinders and look at it more broadly. That's part of the reason that I'm excited about AMIA because AMIA is one of those organizations that is multidisciplinary. It is not made up of a bunch of doctors or a bunch of nurses. It is very cross-disciplinary. In fact, the exciting discussions that occur generally occur when you've got all the disciplines in the same room when they're debating one another and having discussions around where to go and how to get there. So I think that's a real strength. I want to. I, I like to tell stories. I think stories are much more powerful than giving you lots of data. Uh, there's the story of the woman who grew up in the mountains, and uh, every day she would get up, 
and she would go climb the mountain. And over the course of a couple of decades, she became known far and wide as the best mountain climber that anybody could ever remember. She developed calluses on her fingertips from all of the climbing that she did. She had sinewy muscles. She had an ability to leap from one boulder to another with a single leap. She had an ability to climb up sheer cliffs in ways that other climbers couldn't even approach. Well, one morning she gets up and she looks over in another direction at this other mountain. She goes, huh, you know, I haven't climbed that mountain. I think I'm going to go climb it. So she gets up and she starts climbing the mountain. She comes up to this ridge as she's going over towards this mountain that she's never been to before. And all of a sudden, she sees something that she has never seen before. It's a very different kind of a mountain. It's flat, and it's blue. And she goes, wow, that is the most interesting mountain I've ever seen in my life. Well, she climbs down to this mountain. She reaches out. She touches it, and it ripples in all sorts of directions. Wow, that's a strange kind of mountain. She touches it again, and she smells it. It's sweet. She touches it again. It's moist on her fingertips. She goes, wow, that's an interesting mountain. I'm going to climb that mountain. And with all of her talents, all of her skills, all of her capabilities, being the best mountain climber that anybody had ever known, she jumped on that mountain, and with all of her mountain climbing forces, she began to sink. Now, what happened over the next couple of hours, and actually over the next couple of days because she practiced this in the following days, is that she learned a couple of things about climbing that mountain. She learned that in fact, if she climbed in a synchronous way with her arms and her legs, that she could propel herself through this mountain. She learned that if she turned her head just right when she had her arm outstretched, that she could catch her breath. She learned that she had different muscles that she hadn't been using in a long time. She learned a whole bunch of new skills. She learned how to swim the lake. I would submit to you that in healthcare, we have a whole bunch of really, really good mountain climbers, and we're standing in front of a lake, and that we need to really rethink maybe some of the skills that we need to bring to bear. So for example, I just was in Chicago this last week, and then following the Chicago meeting, I, I was a speaker at the Chicago Health Executive Forum and we were talking about accountable care. And one of the points that I made is that, you know, it's one thing to talk about accountable care from a concept standpoint. It's a, another thing to talk about accountable care from a culture standpoint. We have built an infrastructure in healthcare delivery that is an individual sport. And now we're saying we're going to work on a team sport? Hmm. Sounds like we've got a bunch of golfers going to the Writers Cup. <laughs> It's, it takes a whole different strategy, a whole different strategy to win the Writers' Cup than it does to go out and play golf on your own. So I guess my feeling is that I think we've got a bunch of work in front of us if we're really going to be serious about moving in these new directions. Tony mentioned that uh, over the last couple of years I had the opportunity to live internationally. I lived in London and actually traveled all over the world as part of the Perot effort, uh, we, we were involved in deploying uh, electronic health record systems uh, internationally. One of the interesting things for me was to sort of get an aha, which is that as I travel around the world, and I don't care whether it's the Middle East or Latin America or Southeast Asia or Europe or Far East, Africa, there are three issues that dominate the discussions around healthcare. It's the cost of healthcare. Actually, it's not the cost of health care. People want free health care. Second thing, they, they want quality health care. No, no, no. They don't want quality health care. They want perfect health care. Does anybody want to be admitted to HUP this afternoon and have a nosocomial infection this evening? Does anybody want to volunteer for that particular experiment? You know, uh, I've been talking to healthcare audiences for about 10 years. I've never had a single volunteer for that particular challenge. Uh, service, uh, at least in the United States, but I say around the world, people want their care and they want it right now. They don't want to wait. 
we've learned that in other aspects of our lives we can have those expectations and so why can't we do that in healthcare? Over the weekend, I decided, uh, and I'm, so I'm gonna give you a very good example of this. Over the weekend, I decided that uh, I needed to get my flu shot. Well, I decided that the best way to do that would be to go to CVS to the clinic and, uh, you know, not stand in line and uh, get my flu shot. So I went and I registered through their little registration process. I sat down in my chair and after 45 minutes, I got up and I said, enough of this. <laughs> and I walked out because I wanted my care right now. I went to CVS specifically so I could get my care right now. If I wanted to wait 45 minutes, I'd go see my regular doctor. So, you know, service is a big issue. And, and if there is an industry that isn't very service oriented, it is healthcare. It is a problem for us. The other thing is that we're moving from an information um, theocracy, which is, hey, I'm Dr. Fickenshire. I went to medical school in North Dakota, uh, did my residency in New York City. Uh, I've done all these things. I got some certificates I can show you. I'm really smart and I've talked to you and examined you and here's the answer to your problem. To an information democracy, which is, oh, Dr. Fickenshire, I looked you up on the web last night. I discovered that you graduated near the bottom of your medical school class. Uh, Dr. Fickenshire, it says here that for the particular procedure that you're recommending that you're in the bottom quartile of all physicians who provide this service. Uh, Dr. Fickenshire, would you please explain why I should let you touch me? That's information democracy. So we have a whole new framing of the interaction that we as clinicians are having uh, with the people that need our services. So what are some of those tsunamis? Well, one of them is that we're in the global economy. It's uh, very clear that, that that's having a, a huge impact around the world. It's clearly having, you know, we're, we're complaining about 7.8% unemployment. Uh, but you go to places like Greece and Spain and other places and it's even way higher than that. Front page of the Washington Post this morning was an article about how people from Lisbon uh, in Portugal are moving to Mozambique because they can get jobs there and they speak Portuguese. Uh, you know, that tells you something about what's going on in the global economy. People are going where the opportunities are. The other thing that's happening is that the various countries that have formulated the entitlement programs are seeing the stress of supporting those entitlement programs. And this is not just a Medicare issue in the United States. This is an NHS issue in, uh, in the UK. It's an issue in uh, virtually every country that I've, I have been to. I, I don't see this as a non-issue in any country. So the stresses uh, on the economies of these governments is pretty substantial. We have the boomers, and this tends to be, a, we think of it as a phenomenon in the United States, but there's a, a problem in China uh, with not enough uh, young people coming along as well. So we have an aging population in China because of the one child policy. Uh, and the boomers are an interesting group. They, they have expectations. I am a boomer. I am 62 years old. My generation brought you the little red wagon. We, we created Schwinn Bicycles as a company. We single-handedly did that because of our desire to have Schwinn bicycles. We uh, made U.S. Keds uh, a shoe company. We've done a lot of things uh, in our era, and uh, we're going to change healthcare because of our demands. Uh, I'm pretty convinced of that. Not only that, but the provider base reflects the population base. So fully, one-third of all the primary care physicians in this country, one-third are going to either become disabled, die, or retire in the next eight years. Think about that. One-third of all primary care physicians are going to either become disabled, die, or retire in the next eight years. That's a pretty frightening Phenomenon. So do we think that the existing workforce model that we have in place, which is a hierarchical pyramidal structure with physicians and then others, do we think that's going to work? I don't think so. I don't think so. And at the core, I would say to you that informatics is going to be one of the tools that helps us to figure out new models of how we can deliver care. Genomics, when I went to medical school, we literally had a one-week course in genomics. Uh, if you had a one-week course today, you couldn't survive very long. Um, 
actually what's interesting is I've been pulled into some discussions in Washington, D.C. by the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, regarding what is the core curriculum that we should have in place for informatics in medical school. It reminds me of the discussion around genomics back in 1973. Uh, so I think that uh, we're on our way, at least in the field of uh, uh, informatics. The internet has clearly changed everything. I don't need to explain that one. And then I do believe that in the healthcare industry that there is a difference in the kinds of services and products that people offer, and we don't recognize that. We treat uh, a mom with a single mom with three kids the same as we do a 63-year-old with the same problem. And, you know, they got different issues. They got different problems that they're trying to deal with. And yet, from a service standpoint, we treat everybody kind of, you know, chop it out. Ooh, that was a mistake to say that. Uh, that was an accident, by the way. <laughs> um, so that, that is uh, clearly the service is, is a big issue. So what are some of the healthcare forces that are specific to the healthcare industry? First of all, we're seeing large-scale consolidation. Uh, it's really been interesting. And I think uh, as a result of the election, the consolidation move is going to accelerate, not slow down. And by acceleration, what I mean is, uh, for example, I'm aware of two of the largest healthcare systems on the West Coast that are, they're large. I mean, they're, these are actually, both of them are in excess of $5 billion a year who are talking about merging to create a even larger entity uh, so that they can manage care on the West Coast. Uh, we're seeing the breakdown of traditional boundaries. Uh, you know, is anybody in this audience, did anybody predict that Walmart would be in the healthcare business? It sort of missed me. I didn't, I saw others but I didn't see Walmart. Um, or cross-industry convergence in this state with Highmark, you know, uh, buying a healthcare delivery organization. Uh, I think we're gonna see more of that. The rising tide of technology clearly is an issue. And then finally, workforce globalization. At Perot, one of the things that we did is that we, we took over uh, information technology uh, operations and we globalize them. So we move services to wherever we could provide them more effectively, more efficiently, and, and less costly. Uh, and we did that on a global basis. I would submit to you that anything that is digital can be moved any place. And that service can be provided from any place. So in particular for the fields of radiology, for dermatology, for pathology, uh, I make the argument that providing those services on a virtual basis actually would increase the quality of care. It's going to make it a lot better. So, and that service can be provided any place. It doesn't have to be here in town. Matter of fact, I know of an academic medical center where the radiology department does close down at 6 o'clock and services are transferred to Bangalore in India. So we're seeing workforce globalization as a major uh, trend within the healthcare industry. So what do people really want in healthcare? This is what people want. This is what providers want. This is what planners design. This is what regulators want. This is what politicians pass as law. <laughs> this is what gets implemented. This is what the media reports. This is what the government funds. And this is what the public understands. Folks, I have just in seven slides shared with you American healthcare. This is, I mean, this is essentially what it's all about. Um, so the question is, where are we going? Oliver Wendell Holmes was, as you all know, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court at the turn of the century. And at that period of time, uh, the people traveled by train. And so he was seen one day <clears throat> over at Union Station in Washington, which is this marvel, it's been totally renovated. I, I was there in 1968, and I remember it was filled with pigeons because it had gone into disuse. And now they've renovated it, and it's quite a beautiful structure. Uh, and they're doing now some even more renovations. Um, but anyway, so Oliver Wendell Holmes was seen uh, on the tarmac by the chief conductor. And uh, Mr. Holmes was, uh, he was very well known. Uh, everybody knew who he was. He was sort of going through his pockets and he was checking 
the satchel, and, and so the uh, chief conductor walked over to him and said, uh, sir, is there anything I can do to help you? And Mr. Holmes was rather gruff and said, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. About 10 minutes later, the chief conductor goes around the corner and he sees Mr. Holmes, he's got his satchel out, he's got his clothes strewn around, and he's obviously looking for something, and the chief conductor goes, ah, I know what the problem is. And he walks over to Mr. Holmes and he says, sir, uh, I'm the chief conductor here, I know who you are, uh, there's no need for you to worry about your ticket, I will get you on the train and uh, we'll get you to where you need to go. And Mr. Holmes stood up at his full height of six foot two and said, sir, the issue is not do I have a ticket, the issue is where am I going? So the question for us is where are we going? Where are we going? Well, I've got some thoughts on that that I'd like to share with you that tie into uh, you know, the field, of, uh, our field of informatics. Um, the ability to interface information and data offers us the possibility of really unbounded opportunities of discovery. But as Ross and I were talking here a little bit ago, if we don't have standards in place, this is gonna fail. We're not going to be able to communicate. And so we need to really be supporting the notion that we need to have unbounded opportunities of discovery. That that's really what the field of informatics is all about. It's about discovering, it's about finding out. The reason we exist as a profession is because people think that we can help make healthcare better. And you know what? That's the reason I get up in the morning, is I, I get up to try to make healthcare better. That's the reason I'm doing this. So as a field, I think it's incumbent upon us to really think about that and try to figure out what our role is. We currently have clearly a cacophony of data, but it's not, we're not able to make it uh, synthetic. We can't make it work together. Um, managing healthcare in the circle of life, it, it depends on the field of informatics really to help with that continuum. And finally, uh, I think we need to step forward and become activists in this area and we need to, uh, we also need to, I think, uh, I think we need to eventually think about how we manage privacy differently. You know, when the HIPAA law was created, we didn't have the cloud. We didn't have mobile devices. We didn't have a whole bunch of stuff that we've got today. So how do you manage in that kind of a world? And we've got laws that were written, you know, 15 years ago that are managing that process. So. At some point, we need to have that discussion as well. As I look at healthcare, it seems to me that there's really four major things that need to occur as part of our transformation effort. First of all, we need to look at the environment that we're in. It's very clear that the environment is, is challenged in the United States. Medicare is the central target of every discussion that's going on in Washington, D.C. We are at, Medicare is absolutely right in the middle, along with Medicaid. Matter of fact, they're, they're having discussions on Friday uh, about the fiscal cliff. Bonnier and, and Obama are getting together. And uh, I can tell you that the number one issue, aside from the tax issue, which is, you know, are we going to raise taxes or not, or get rid of the Bush tax or whatever we're going to do on the tax side, on the cost side, Medicare and how to change Medicare is a central point of discussion. So the environment that we're in is an issue. The financial situation that the nation is in because of the recession and the fact that we are now a global economy. Um, the goods and services that we produce in this country are not competitive if uh, there's an extra cost and that extra cost is related to healthcare services. That's a problem. And if you talk to small industry, they will talk about this as a, as a big issue. Um, there's the personal side. I mean, people have individual expectations. I have been ill, uh, and my family members have been ill. I just went through a, a process with my father-in-law who passed away. Uh, you know, we all have our personal stories around healthcare and what failed as a result of that. I can tell you that when I had my surgery about seven years ago, that if I hadn't been alert, I would have been medicated totally incorrectly. But I said, wait a minute, what, what are you doing? You know, and I was doing this in a haze. And I was managing myself. Now, that doesn't happen every, every day to every patient, but it happens enough that it's like it shouldn't happen at all. I mean, you know, I have to tell you, I get on planes every week, every week. 
I do not have any fears. Now, maybe I should, <laughs> but I don't have any fears that my plane is going to crash. I really don't. I don't even think about it. If I walked into a hospital and was admitted today, I would be thinking about all of the potential problems that could occur. I would be on heightened alert. And that's endemic to our industry, and I think we have the responsibility for helping to solve that problem. And then finally, there's the cultural issue, which I was talking about before, which is we have had uh, almost a century now of sort of individual sport training when, in fact, we need to do team sport. And that is a whole different environment. And then you put on top of that the fact that we need capital. These are the central issues that I think are forcing us to have a discussion around how we're going to transform the American healthcare system. And by the way, <clears throat> I would say to you, whatever decisions we decide to make in this country are being watched by everybody else. They look at what we do and learn from our lessons. So in, as it relates to health care reform, phase one was really where we passed the legislation. Phase two then became where it was validated by the Supreme Court in, in June of 2012 with their decision that basically said everything is fine except that the feds can't tell the states what to do on Medicaid. And then finally, we're now into the testing phase. Clearly, we're into testing. Uh, literally, after the morning after the election, uh, the pundits were all talking about how, well, health care, accountable health care is going to go forward, and absolutely it is. So we should get on with it, would be my perspective. So what is the approach, and what does all this mean? Well, it means that we're moving towards value-based purchasing, uh, where we're going to be talking about things like bundled payments, the primary care medical home has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, actually, I was at a meeting here uh, two weeks ago with some specialists who were talking about the primary specialist home, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they're trying to get in on the, on the act as well. But it was interesting because it was around, uh, you know, diabetes. And in fact, diabetes is a problem that makes a lot of sense to probably have a medical home around diabetes for certain populations. Uh, and then finally, accountable care organizations, wh whatever they are. Uh, if you've seen one accountable care organization, you've seen one accountable care organization at this point. There is no cookie cutter approach. Uh, I think we're going to see lots of models. Matter of fact, the um, book Laboratories of Democracy is the book that I point people to in learning as it relates to this issue. It was written by a professor at Harvard about 20 some years ago. And basically, it said that the states represent the petri dishes of the, of the United States uh, democracy. And uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of experimentation. Uh, there's been lots of discussion around the fact that Kaiser, you know, is a model. Cleveland Clinic is a model. Yeah, those are really good models. I was a Kaiser patient for the 12 years that I lived in San Francisco. But I would also say to you that creating a network and having a network model for accountable care is also a viable model. And I've seen some very interesting work uh, being done in other places around the nation on that topic. So uh, I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation. The end result, though, is that it is the things that are going to be supported are going to be those that drive efficiency and effectiveness and outcomes. So we're moving from a volume-based model of care delivery to a value-based model of care delivery. And I think we would all agree, we all know, that uh, when you start talking value-based, you start talking about a whole different set of activities. Matter of fact, what's interesting is that I would hold up pediatrics as the one specialty that has done a much better job than all the other specialties in promoting prevention and really moving healthcare ahead of the curve. Um, but we can even do more in the field of pediatrics. Um, so uh, clearly we're changing our whole notion. So what does this mean for healthcare? Well, it means a couple of things. It means that we're, we need to reduce hospitalizations. About a year ago, I was asked the question. I was up on stage. I was in front of about 2,000 people, and somebody in the audience said, Kevin, uh, what does the hospital of the future look like? thought about it for a minute, and I said, I think it's your living room. And in fact, as I thought about that, I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, I think we're still going to need institutions. 
we're still going to need to provide certain services at places like this. But increasingly, we're also pushing that care into other kinds of environments, one of which is the living room. Uh, let me use a non-pediatric example. Uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, in Harvard, about eight, nine years ago, they did a study, <clears throat> and what they did is they gave electronic scales to con patients with congestive heart failure. And what they would do is they would get those patients every morning when they got up, they would go out and they would step on the scale, and then they would step off, and the data would go into the computer. And, the, and we all know that congestive heart failure, that you start to gain weight about 72 to 96 hours before you go into fluid failure. So what happened? What's the best way to figure that out? Well, you weigh people, and if they've gained a certain percentage of weight overnight, you go, hey, Mrs. Jones, maybe you should take some extra Lasix. Uh, maybe your weight is up enough. I'm going to send out the home health nurse to, to take a look at you. What they did is they showed very dramatic drop in congestive heart failure patients coming into the emergency room. What happened to the project? It was closed down. Why? Because patients weren't coming into the emergency room. Now, that, now that's what you get when you have a volume-based approach to healthcare. A value-based approach to healthcare would say, Let's give scales to all of our congestive heart failure patients. Let's, let's boy, that's, that's a freebie. <laughs> we want to keep you out of the institution. We don't want you coming to the emergency room. So all of these issues are, are really at the forefront of what we need to be thinking about as it relates to hosp uh, uh, healthcare delivery. What this means, from my perspective, is that revenue for hospitals and for hospital expenditures is going to go down and revenue for alternative care venues is going to go up. I mean, that's the central reason why we're seeing cons massive consolidation um, uh, and why I think that's only going to continue. So I believe that we need to embrace the future. We need to look at the territory with new eyes and we need to have a different perspective. And that's what I've trying to been, uh, that's what I've been trying to encourage everybody to do. So what does all this mean? Well, I'd like to turn for a moment and, and share with you, first of all, my notion of transformation, which is that, first of all, it, you know, frequently in the technology areas, we, we talk about technology. And uh, while I'm a technophile, I don't think it's about the technology. I mean, the technology works, by and large. It's about people, and it's about process, and you put that together with the technology, and then you create value. And so I think one of the issues that we have faced in healthcare, particularly as it relates to the use of electronic health records and all of, much of the stuff that we work with, is that we haven't spent sufficient time on the people and process issues, and we've simply deployed systems, and then they don't work, or we create work on top of work, and physicians throw up their hands and say, I don't want to use that. So we need to focus more on the people and process issues. And the interchange between each of these are the challenges that exist. So the interface between people and process is a change management issue. The interface between process and technology is an implementation management issue. And enablement is really the issue of working with people and technology. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, the reason uh, a lot of physicians haven't embraced the mobile phone as their device is that it doesn't have enough real estate for them to really look at. Now, with the new tablets, you know, I think it's an open question. Uh, I think a lot of docs are starting to use those. Uh, so, uh, particularly the ones that fold over, that are kind of, that's kind of neat. Um, so, that's an enablement issue. So, I think that uh, as we look at technology, we need to look at it from all of these different uh, perspectives. What I'd like to do is talk with you about six areas that I think of, of, that relate to technology, and then uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. Do I have about another 10, 15 minutes? Is that correct? Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I got enough time for Q&A. Okay, 10. Okay. I'll speed it up here. Um, so let's talk about these six issues. Let's talk about first workforce globalization. I already mentioned this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, you can see the data that's there. Um, you know, a third of all primary care physicians. That, that is a scary thought. That is. It makes me nervous. Uh, I do think that we have not had enough discussion in this country about how we're going to redeploy our workforce uh, and that that discussion needs to be precipitated by the healthcare field 
we're the only ones that can really come up with the answers for that question and we haven't really had the debate and I think we need to. So very interesting questions there. On the issue of uh, the professional collaboration, um, we have tended uh, to think of ourselves as guilds. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, the American Academy of Dermatology uh, and I challenged them here about, uh, this is about eight weeks ago now, I challenged them because the speaker that spoke right before me talked about how we need to protect dermatology and you know hold up the walls and I stood up and said you know if I was a dermatologist I would in the new environment I would want to make sure that the family physicians knew dermatology I would want to make sure that the pediatricians could practice as much dermatology as they possibly could and then I would help them with the problems that they can't solve that's creating a value-based approach to healthcare versus a volume-based approach to healthcare so the guilds, from my perspective, are dead. They're dead in this new environment, and we should get on with it and try to think of different ways of working with one another. We are clearly moving from a cottage industry to a post-industrial care delivery approach where we're going from non-integrated, dedicated artisans to really standardization uh, and meaningful and respectful reporting. Again, if we don't have that foundation, of data standards, it's going to be very, very difficult to accomplish. Um, so clearly, we're moving in a new direction. Uh, th this is a, an example. I, I use dermatology for an example. My, my partner, she's a dermatologist, and so I like to use dermatology examples. Uh, uh, so uh, I was talking with her about this uh, recently, and I learned And that's her. So, <laughs> uh, I learned from her that um, every year there's about 240,000 uh, admissions per year uh, for cellulitis. And what's interesting about that is that only uh, a th about a third are misdiagnosed. Okay, so that means that we admit these patients. They're put on all these antibiotics, very expensive antibiotics, and uh, there's no need for it. It's not, it's, you know, stasis dermatitis. It's a bunch of other things. It's not uh, cellulitis. And so the, the issue is, how could that be prevented? Well, what's interesting about this particular problem is that I'm a family physician, and I would say to you that my weakest area as a family doc when I came out of training was dermatology, in fact. Um, and dermatologists can spot cellulitis by simply looking at it. They are really good at that because that's what they do every day. And literally, if you have a dermatologist take a look at, at a case of, quote, po possible cellulitis, they can look at it and can say, no, Dr. Fickenshear, that's not cellulitis. That is another kind of problem. And they're right almost all the time. Well. So why don't we deploy systems that allow us to have our emergency room physicians have an electronic consult with a dermatologist so that we don't inappropriately admit patients to the hospital and treat them with drugs that cost us, uh, and that's 83.4, I apologize, the period has gone there, $83.4 billion a year. That's a lot of money. I don't, I don't care, that's one problem. $83 billion is a chunk of change in my book. I mean, it's not the $10 trillion that we need to figure out, but, it, you know, it, it contributes. It's a couple pennies to put in the hat, you know. So that's just one example. And I bet you that if we surveyed this audience that we could come up with 10 more examples just like this that you all have had experience with, that you know that we know how to solve the problem. We have the data. We have the information. The issue is not in finding new lands, the issue is seeing the territory with new eyes. So we're, we're clearly moving towards alternative uh, care delivery models. Um, about uh, 10 years ago now, uh, 12 years ago, I read this article by Larry Downs. Larry is a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and he wrote an article that appeared in the Industry Standard, and it was about the value curve in terms of technology. And I looked at this curve and I went, wow, you know, this is really what healthcare is all about. So basically, uh, and I, I extrapolated from his notion and created my own. So this is not Larry's work, this is my interpretation of his work. 
and basically what it is is uh, in, in the computing industry what his argument was if you had a product that was unique you can kind of charge anything you want for that product if you're the only one that's making it you know you're in the catbird seat uh, and you can do that versus if you're producing a product that's a commodity you can't charge anything you want for that so in healthcare if I'm the um, best neurosurgeon in the world on a particular procedure, uh, am I going to be able to charge a little bit more than a family doc for the services that I provide? Probably, you know, and people will pay it. Matter of fact, they'll probably pay cash for certain kinds of procedures. Versus if I have general knowledge, like a family doc, you know, can family docs charge anything they want for services? No, it's, it's very difficult. Pediatricians, same, same thing. Um, and so if I had a glioblastoma, if I was to fall over and have a seizure and we'd take me over here to HUP and we'd do a CT scan uh, and we'd find out that I had a glioblastoma, do you think I wouldn't cash out and try to figure out where the best glioblastoma surgeon was in the world? I, I absolutely would because if I don't treat myself, I'm not going to be around in six months. Versus if I'm a 32-year-old mom uh, who's working and I've got to go in for my third urinary tract infection that I know that's what it is, am I going to want to go sit around and wait in Dr. Fickinger's office for three, four hours waiting for him to show up so that I can get my antibiotics? I don't think so. And there are some other organizations that have figured this out. One of the inter interesting things is that the glioblastoma is really a service, and I would argue that treating a UTI, if you do it under protocol, is a product. And yet we treat everything as services. Well, there's other folks in the industry that have figured this out. And they have come in, and unfortunately, CVS uh, failed over the weekend when it related to me. But, you know, I, sh I should have walked across the street to Rite Aid and see if they couldn't have done it better. Uh, it should have been my own little personal test. Um, but, you know, by and large, these folks do a pretty good job. They, they don't treat everything. They treat only a select number of problems, and they do that quite well. Matter of fact, it wouldn't surprise me. If, if we had another company decide to get into the cardiovascular business, you know, it just it wouldn't surprise me at this stage of uh, where I'm at in healthcare. So we'll see. And then finally, virtual delivery. Uh, I've already talked about virtual delivery. Uh, diagnostic diffusion is increasingly what's happening is we're implanting devices that send data. We're capturing uh, massive amounts of data on individuals. Uh, I was at uh, Nike recently. Did you know that Nike has a healthcare unit? Yeah, they have a healthcare unit. They gather data on about, I think they told me, 33 million people who exercise. Now, how they gather that data is through their pedometers, through the chips in their shoes, and the chips in their shirts, and other devices that they are beginning to deploy. They now have a T-shirt. Uh, it's not actually a T-shirt. It's sort of a modified T-shirt that has chips embedded in it that can, you know, measure your um, uh, blood pressure and you know pulse and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a company in in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, that has a little Band-Aid, literally a Band-Aid that does basic uh, uh, tests, electrolytes. It does your pulse. It does your blood pressure. Can you imagine if Nike gets a hold of that one? Hmm. So diagnostic diffusion is beginning to occur. And it's happening with all sorts of devices. That data, once we put it into a central database and we begin to massage it, we are going to, we are going to discover patterns of care that we didn't even know existed. I mean, I think that's what's exciting about our field. We are going to be the discoverers of the 21st century. Uh, in the healthcare field. It is very exciting. And finally, this means that we're moving towards peripheral intelligence, which is that the intelligence is not sitting with an individual, it's really sitting with the system. And this is where I think informatics becomes a very, very powerful tool. Uh, and unfortunately, my graphic isn't showing up here properly. But, um, you know, the, we have biomedical informatics, we have imaging informatics, clinical and public health informatics, which all feed up into the broad field. One of the things that I am particularly excited about is what I call operational informatics, which is really uh, helping AMIA as an organization to begin to extend its base beyond uh, research and academics to also be inclusive 
of the operational side. And I think that by doing that, we are, that's where we're going to discover these patterns of care that we didn't even know existed. So that's going to be kind of exciting. Um, and so the implications. Well, there's a bunch of them. First of all, I pointed out that we're going to have consolidation. I think efficiency and effectiveness are the two watchwords of the day. Uh, productivity is clearly going to become an important issue. And how we foster productivity in this new world uh, as a team sport is going to be interesting. Globalization of care delivery, I think it is uh, horses out of the barn. Uh, that's where we're headed. We should be thinking about how we manage that so that we sustain and actually increase quality. Uh, virtualization, I've already mentioned that. Workforce models need to change. Accountable care is clearly the direction. And finally, information exchange, true exchange, and data analytics are, are what needs to happen. So Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting against existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. That's the challenge in front of healthcare. That's what we need to be thinking about. That's what we need to be debating. That's what we need to be discovering. Very, very quickly, four other points. First, we are now in a networked and virtual world. We're not in a proprietary world. I think that we are moving from a uh, profession-centric world to a system-centric world. I think that's a really important shift for all of us who are in the professions. We are moving from segmented to being global and aggregated. And then finally, I think we're moving from a replication focus to an innovation focus. Uh, not that replication doesn't need to occur, but we need to really drive innovation as part of our discussions and our debates. So, uh, just a couple of things. I would say that, uh, you know, we should never forget that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead said that. It is still true today, these uh, decades later. And I think that's the challenge that is in front of us. So, thank you very much for inviting me to CHOP. It's really been a pleasure to be here all day. And I look forward to coming back in the future as well. So thank you.